Hello and welcome to Round or Round We Go. I'm Emily and I use she and they pronouns. And I'm Paul and I use he and him pronouns. And today we are going to take you to Upney. So, Upney, we pulled out of the bag and thought, this is a... At least we knew where it was. Yes, we knew where it was. And actually, I've been to Upney many times for the better part of the past year and a half. Well, not the better part. I was on furlough for a lot of it. But I was working as a supply teacher, and I often got sent to schools in that area. So I did go to the station a lot, usually running to it to get there before four o'clock so I could pay a pound fifty for my return journey, which you can't do anymore because they've raised the fares. But alas. Uh, so yeah, I know the area to a degree. You don't really know the area. I don't think I've ever got on or off a train at Upney. I've been through it on a train. You've cycled I've past cycled it. cycled past it, indeed. Yeah, and I mean, it, it was tricky with Upney because there isn't a lot. And we thought that with Heron Whetstone, and we found a lot. Um, Heron Wheelstone. Heron. Which isn't where we went. We did no. Tottridge and oh, Whetstone. We did Tottridge and Whetstone. I hate this. I hate this. And we're leaving this in because you know I hate these stations. I don't hate these stations. I am not biased towards any stations. We thought this about Tottridge and Whetstone, and there was actually quite a lot that we found. Um, we did find some interesting stuff about Upney. So it is interesting in the fact that it's the first station after Barking, and Barking's kind of been a traditional endpoint of various things. So in that regard, it has a small degree of interest. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not the most exciting underground station, but it does have a bit of intrigue to its history. And there are some other local things, things that yeah. are exciting, actually. Some really interesting projects that, that I'd seen and or some that I didn't even know about. So it's quite interesting. So shall we start with our rundown of facts? Yes, indeed. Upney Station opened on the 12th of September 1932 and is on the London Underground District line. Upney is in Fair Zone 4 and in the London borough of Barking and Dagenham. In 2019, Upney served 2.55 million passengers. Upney has full level access from street to train thanks to the long, gently sloping ramp which leads down from the station entrance to the station platforms. Upney Station was designed and constructed by the London Midland and Scottish Railway, so was probably designed under the purview of their chief architect, William Henry Hamlin. The origin of the name Upney is a couple of possibilities. It may come from the Old English for upper stream, which was up and egg, combined to make Upney, or it may come from other Old English words meaning island in a marsh or island in a stream. Uh, the exact origin is somewhat islands unclear. Islands in the stream. But, sorry, I can't sing, but whenever you say islands in the stream, I start singing because it's Dolly Parton. And right. you can't sing any more than that, but we'd have to pay yes, copyright. Have... No, you don't, because if you do a cover, it's fine. Anyway, continue. Upney Station is served by Bus Route 62 and Short Walk Worry. There are also Bus Routes 287 and 368. The labyrinth at Upney Station is one Emily has found no, previously. No, I haven't found oh. it, but I've given up on this because I have to edit them anyway, so I'm going to hear Oh, it. yeah, that's true. And I won't really remember. <laughs> well, anyway, the labyrinth at Upney Station is on the westbound platform. Why don't we start with railway history? Because that's mm -hmm. really what we're here for. So let's dive into a little bit of that. The stretch of railway on which Upney Station exists was first built actually long before Upney Station came into existence. Mm -hmm. um, so although the station opened in 1932, the stretch of railway was built all the way back in the late 1880s, uh, opening about 1888, by a company called the London Tilbury and South End Railway. And they were one of the many little Victorian mainline railway companies that had first of all built their route from around Fenchurch Street in central London all the way to South End. But when their routes opened back in originally 1854, it took a very roundabout route to South End, which is the kind of seaside, well, it's a bit of a seaside resort now, east of London. But to get there, they went via Sack Tilbury, which is on the banks of the Thames way to the kind of south of South End. Yeah, so essentially they went in a sort of U shape to get there, where they wanted a route that was very direct, and yeah. that's what they built. Yeah, so having started off with this U-shaped route via 
well, all the places it says on the tin, London, Tilbury, and then finally South End. They wanted to build a shorter, more direct route from London to South End, which they constructed opening in the late 1880s. And that went kind of branching off from their original railway around Barking and then kind of cutting straight across and then joining back up as it went on to South End. And that went through where Upney Station now is, but didn't actually include a station at Upney at all. And at the time was just a mainline railway. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we get into this kind of era of history that we've discussed before, where you used to have railways, which we now consider to be part of the London Underground, working their trains on tracks that are shared with what we now consider to be mainline railways. And they're all running steam trains and they're all running, serving the same stations. Yeah, you get very little of that now. I mean, you get a little bit out on the Metropolitan Line, don't you? There's a few bits yeah. where there is, but it's very rare. Yeah, now. yeah, it's it's a lot less common now. It's basically just a, you know, around Kew and on the District, yeah, and yeah, yeah. up around yeah, up around Amersham on the Met. But it used to be far more common, and that happens uh, from 1902. Wait, hold on. By Q on the district? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, my brain wasn't working. Continue. Yeah. So in 1902, um, there was a new railway company was formed as a joint venture between the district railway and the London Tilbury and South End Railway. And this was going to be called the Whitechapel and Bow Railway. And as it says, it basically connected the district railway at Whitechapel up with the London Tilbury and South End at Bow so that you could run district railway trains all the way to Upminster. Uh, and these would have been steam hauled trains and they would have been kind of, you know, interworking with the other steam hauled mainline trains that were yeah. going all the way to South End and places way down towards the east. And that carried on uh, only for a couple of years, really, up until 1905, mm-hmm. because this is actually when we get towards the end of that period of the sharing of trains between the main lines and the underground, because they electrified the district railway. Electrification time. Yes. All very cool, funded by good old Charles Tyson Yerkes. And when the district railway was electrified, initially going east, they only got as far as East Ham on extra tracks that were built next to the original pair of tracks for the steam trains. Mm. And therefore they cut the services that were run by the district railway back to East Ham and they didn't go all the way to Upminster anymore. And then they gradually started extending eastwards on the sort of new tracks for electric trains running parallel to the steam tracks. So first of all, in 1908, they built the new electric tracks a little bit further to Barking, which is only one more stop. Yeah, one stop more from East Ham. <laughs> and then they waited up until the 1930s because... Um, so you say gradually. It was essentially, they built one station, they, they electrified to one more station and then waited yeah. like 20-some years. To... Yeah, well, I think they were intending to carry on, but, you know, there were a few major worldwide yes, events took yes. place in the 1910s that got in the yes, way. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, and they had to sit and wait until they had the money in the 1930s and that's when there were all sorts of huge railway expansions in the 1930s in London and they managed to extend the district line then all the way to Upminster on new tracks running parallel to the main line and that's when they built a stage well they built the new station at Upney and then they also built Beacontree station Beacontree Beckentree I have been spending a long time looking at different ways to pronounce this, and I have seen people pronouncing them both ways, people who both look like Londoners. If you are from the area and you've got a strong opinion, get in touch, because it seems even Wikipedia said there were two different pronunciations, but also I can't read the phonetic way they write it, so I don't know what they are. So that station, and also then they built Dagenham Heathway and Dagenham East and Hornchurch and Upminster were all rebuilt in a kind of very similar style. And yeah, they look almost identical, most of the stations from the yeah. street. I know when we were cycling it, we're like, oh, look, it's exactly the same as the last one we saw. And all of these stations would be served by the district railway trains, but they weren't built by the district railway, because this is when we get into a bit of an oddity of the London Underground and, well, the mainline railways at the time. The London Tilbury and South End Railway, back in 1912, when it was all different private companies, had been bought by a company called the Midland Railway, which is best known in London for operating the main line out of St Pancras um, and then lots of other lines up in the Midlands. They bought the railways from Fenchurch Street to South End, including this bit of route. They then, in 1923, when there was the kind of amalgamation of all these dozens and dozens of little railway companies into four big railway companies, 
became part of one called the London, Midland and Scottish Railway. So I have a question about the London, Midland and Scottish Railway. Go for it. So I know where London is. Yeah. I know where the Midlands are. Yeah. I know where Scotland is. Yeah. There's a big bit in the middle. What are they? Are they not stopping there? Are they just, are they ignoring the north like happen, like often happens in England? What's going on there? So the London, Midlands and Scottish, it was a combination of loads of these smaller private companies. Yeah. Um, the main constituent parts were the Midland Railway, which mm-hmm. was the railway basically from St Pancras up towards the Midlands, and it was lots of railways in the kind of middle of the country, yeah, yeah. and the Seton Carlisle Railway as well. Yeah. And it was also the London and North Western Railway, which was Euston all the way up to Scotland on what we now call the West Coast Main Line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was how it kind of got all the way through the north of the country. So it only stopped probably the same similar places to where that line stops now, so kind of... I don't know, it stops at um, Lancaster and, and Carlisle and stuff. So probably, I don't know if there's yeah. not more places. I think but... they would have had lots of, you know, local routes and branch lines and other subsidiary yeah. routes as well. Uh, and they had joint ventures with some of the other companies. It all got very complicated. And then did they take over any of the Scottish railways or was it just I think, the, yeah, Scotland? they operated, yeah, the yeah. railways, some of the railways in Scotland. Although the others would have been operated by the London and North Eastern Railway. Which um, has nothing to do with Scotland and its name. Oh, these names, I really don't yeah. like them. Scotland, well, they had the northeastern side of the country, you see, so they got. They got Scotland they as got well. Bits of, they Scotland got the eastern is now part, part of, of Scotland. England. I'm not sure they got Scotland's the eastern very happy part of Scotland. <laughs> All right, fair enough. So that was the London, Midland, and Scottish Railway. And basically, the district railway was providing their sort of local services on their behalf when they extended the electrified route to Upminster. So it was actually the London, Midland and Scottish Railway that designed and built the stations at Upney and the other new stations that opened at the time. It was probably their chief architect, William Henry Hamlin, who designed the station. It certainly looks very similar to other stations that there are sources saying he designed. Mm -hmm. Um, So it looks like it was him who did it. And it actually resulted in the station being operated, first of all, by the London, Midland and Scottish Railway staff, uh, you know, selling the tickets and working on the platforms and that sort of thing. And then when the London Midland and Scottish Railway got nationalised in 1948 and became part of British Railways, it was the British Rail staff who operated the station right up until 1969. And there were still just underground trains stopping there? Or... Yeah, it would have been underground trains. And in fact, some of the underground trains, although operated by the underground, were owned by the London Midland and Scottish Railway because, again, they were the underground providing the services sort of on behalf of the London, Midland and Scottish. So they had to pay for some of the trains. So when they were building this extra bit of electrified railway in the late or well, the early 1930s, they had to order some new carriages, 45 new carriages of a type called L class, because the district railway liked to letter their carriages, uh, much like we still have, you know, the S stock today. And before mm-hmm. that, the D stock and the A stock and the C stock. This was what, the L class. What do those letters mean? It's complicated. Okay, we won't go into yeah. it now. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, they sort of started from A and worked onwards, but a lot and of so it was retro. To, so we yeah. got to D, which is... The no, one. we got all the way to T, um, but some of it was retroactive, like what we call now the B stock, wasn't actually called the B stock at the time. Oh my God. Yeah, exactly. It's complicated. Oh, and then they it. restarted at A in the 1960s with the A stock going to Amersham, even though we'd had previous and A then stock. Then we jumped from D to S stock? Yes. Okay, great. That, was, that makes perfect sense. Yes. It was considered calling it E stock, which would, I think, have been E for excellent or E for everywhere, uh, or S stock, which is supposed to be like S for superior or subsurface. It, sound, it sounds like how Google does their operating systems in different types of candy, that kind of... Yeah, it, it, <laughs> looks, it's, it looks logical if you look at it for about 30 seconds, and if you look at it for 35 seconds, <laughs> then you realise it's a complete mess. Okay. Um, yes. The only way to make it logical would be to get rid of all the names and start from scratch, but that would just make it even worse. Yeah. So, okay. yes. Okay. So, London Midland and Scottish Railway own some of the trains, but just to keep things confusing, those trains were not dedicated to that service. They would have just been mixed in with all the other district line trains. And, you know, you might have got one carriage in a train, but they wouldn't have been kind of set as these trains they owned were the ones that served up me and the other stations on that route. And they, again, 1948, with nationalisation of... The mainline railways, they went under ownership of London Transport rather than weirdly sticking with British Rail or something confusing like that. 
So those were the trains? Those were the trains. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. When when you said they went with London Transport ownership, I was just not sure if that was the trains or the station. Yeah. The station, I know. So, yes, yeah, so the yeah. trains got put under London Transport ownership in 1948, but for some reason the station stuck around under British Rail ownership until 1969. And I'm not entirely clear on why British Rail hung on to it until then, given none of their trains went there. But there we are. Foibles of bureaucracy, I'm sure. The station itself has not a lot of particularly interesting architectural features. One of the windows is bricked over, unlike the identical one at Dagenham Heathway. What a <laughs> what a big a big shift there. It yeah, it's a very plain station. It's it's quite a nice, attractive one, I think. It's sort of simple brick structure, you know, dark red brick, flat concrete roof. It's got a few details in kind of thinner, like Roman style bricks that are, you know, not very high at all, just to add a bit of interest to it. I can't say I've ever noticed it as anything. I I think I will if I'm back at the station at any point, look in a little more detail. But yeah, haven't noticed anything particular. It has the original edging stones along both edges, drain hoppers that say 1931, but it wasn't open until 1932. So maybe it was a delayed opening or they just put the date that they were manufactured. Yeah. Yeah. And there are original benches in the waiting room. The waiting room is quite nice. I've never noticed because I always just run down there and try to get on a train. Yeah, I mean, it's quite rare. Anyone has to use a waiting room on the underground, really. But yeah, they're, they're nice sort of wooden benches, although unfortunately painted in sort of rather garish bright blue rather than being their original sort of varnished wood or whatever they would have been. Alas. Yeah. It is There's a few that have been restored and around the place and look really beautiful. But There's a lot of GWR lovely benches hanging around yeah. places, but... Yeah. Alas, Hammersmith Station, which we yes, exactly. Yeah, the lovely has GWR bench. I mean, obviously, this wasn't anywhere near the GWR. <laughs> although they do seem to wander astray, you seem to find them yes. at random places. Is that all we have on the station? I think that's about it. You know, it's it's a nice, simple little station, not too complicated a history. We do have a couple of other things in the area which are actually quite interesting. If you are just here for the trains and the stations, I completely understand. You can skip to the end now and listen to us pull out the new station. But there are lots of interesting bits of local history around there. And one of them, which I had no idea existed, neither did you, Paul, Mm -hmm. was Eastbury Manor House. Now, Eastbury Manor is not something we would expect to find beside uh, Upney Station. It's an Elizabethan manor house, essentially, that's owned by the National Trust and is sometimes open, obviously COVID being COVID, but it is open sometimes to the public. They have a lot of community and family events and things there. It's fully wheelchair accessible, which is really cool for a house that old. They've built a lift. There's been a lot of money that's been put into it in the past few years essentially to renovate it and make it a community space um but the manor interesting history so we learned a new word which was massage 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 m-e-s-s-a-u-g-e which is essentially like lands associated with a church so it was barking abbey that had all these lands and when the monasteries were dissolved by Henry VIII, these lands were sold off. And we don't know what kind of building was on the property before these lands were sold off or shortly after they were sold off. But this building was most likely built around 1572. We're not sure the exact date, but sometime around 1572. Now, there's a long list of all the people who live there. It's not particularly exciting. You could definitely look it up. Actually, their website has a really, really good timeline of everything that happened in the house. What is probably the most interesting thing is the not very well substantiated claims that the gunpowder plot was plotted or sort of at least associated with the house. So there's some kind of local legends around that. Essentially, we do know that it was a house where Catholics would stay, Catholics would take refuge. It was a place where people could practice Catholicism and they felt safe doing that, or I guess safe to a degree. It could very well just be anti-Catholic sentiment that started these rumors. But, okay, this is about a six degrees of separation thing, so let me get this entirely straight. So in 1603, the house was rented by Anne Steward. To the merchant John Moore. So Anne Stewart owned it. She rented it to John Moore, who was an alderman of London. He was married to a Spanish woman named Maria Perez de Recalde, 
Her stepdaughter was married to Lewis Tresham, who was the younger brother of gunpowder plotter Francis Tresham. I mean, it's pretty <laughs> tenuous, that, yeah. isn't it? I mean, if, if it is a place where Catholics were staying, they could have stayed there. But the suggestion that it was actually plotted there is a little bit wild. There's even suggestion in sort of local legend that Lord Monteagle, so if people don't know the history of the gunpowder plot, uh, you know, it was the plot for Guy Fawkes and his accomplices to blow up the Houses of Parliament in 1605. Essentially, the reason Guy Fawkes was caught was one of the members of the House of Lords, Lord Monteagle, who was friends or sort of acquaintances with some of the plotters and they wrote him a letter saying don't attend the state opening of parliament on the 5th of november because it's uh not safe for you to do so and he thought this is strange or they, they didn't even say it wasn't safe for you to do so i think they just said don't attend and they thought that was a little strange and they had them search the the cellars and found guy fox there interestingly every time the queen comes to parliament today they still do a ceremonial sweep of the cellars and they don't find anything hopefully but um uh, I'm so used to saying our security is very good at Parliament. It's been a long time since I worked there. I still say it. So there's a suggestion that Lord Monteagle, the one who got this message, was actually at Eastbury Mansion when this happened. When, when he got the warning letter. Yeah, he got the warning letter, essentially. But it's not a strong suggestion. The other piece of possible evidence around that is Daniel Defoe. So the writer Daniel Defoe... 1726 so this is 121 years later yeah he said he wrote a little beyond the town which is barking on the road to dagenham stood a great house ancient and now almost fallen down where tradition says the gunpowder plot was at first contrived and that all the first constitutions about it were held there like, I don't know how he would possibly have actually known that. Maybe he had evidence we don't have, but we can't really find any evidence around that. It's about as definite as Rudolf Hess having been <laughs> Totteridge and Whetstone, really. Every time I see Daniel Defoe, I think about how in high school we had a salon in which we had to pick a person out of a hat and I got Daniel Defoe, so I dressed up as Daniel Defoe. I don't really know that much about Daniel Defoe. I mean, I did some research at the time, but I've forgotten it. He lived in Stoke Newington. There's a lot of... A lot of things about him around Stoke Newington. So yeah, that's really the sort of evidence we have. It's very scant. Essentially, the house was going to be demolished in the 1910s. And the, it was, is a Society for Protection of, what's it called? Ancient Buildings? Yes. The one started by William Morris. They got together and they saved it. It was a Barking Museum for a little while. And then it just, yeah, it's owned by the National Trust. And I want to visit sometime when that is allowed. Yeah, yeah. Something to do once we can go back outside again. Yes, and we can go to Upney and see those 1931 drain spouts. And the is, original benches. Yes, it's, it's, all we, it's all we dream of. And I can get, I can get the labyrinth there. Yes. So that's good too. What I think is actually the most exciting thing in the area, though, is Maysbrook Park. Paul, I know you haven't been out there and seen Maysburg Park. I've been to Maysburg Park because I've taught around there. Also, Robert Penbrook, my massage therapist, he's right around there. Plug for him. He's great. Works in his house around there. But Maysburg Park is just sort of northeast of Upney Station. And I thought, you know, it's just a nice park. I never really put that much thought into it. And while I was researching this, I found out it's actually the first climate change park in the UK. So essentially, it has had measures put in place to do a lot of things, but one of them is mitigating climate change or mitigating the impacts of climate change. So it was originally a project to sort of work around the actual, the brook, the maze brook, and they wanted to make the brook essentially more resilient, have wider floodplains if there's a lot of rain, um, less likely to be damaged by drought. So there was a lot of work around that. And no, I don't live in the area. I don't know how people feel about the park. Generally, there could be a lot of locals who are unhappy because what I'm reading online is is reports done by the people going around building this park. Who was it who built the park? So interestingly, it was this combination of private, public, and charity. So there was donations from various charities that got involved. Uh, it was the mayor of London. There was a sort of save a local park or help a local park campaign. Barking Dagenham Council, and yeah, private 
groups working on it, private contractors and things. So there was this whole redevelopment of it. Now, the park existed originally from the 1930s. So actually around the time the station was built, that's when Beacontree, Beacontree Estate, which we will get to when we get to that station, was built. It's the largest housing estate in Europe, or was at the time, still probably is. And it was built as a recreation space. And it was a really lovely park when it was first built. Apparently has the nickname Matchstick Park because of some of the building process. They thought it looked like a matchstick. Either that or a lot of matchsticks were dumped there at some point. (laughs) Who knows? Um, And it was open for those residents. And interestingly, actually, 85% of the workforce had to come from a local labor exchange because there was so much unemployment in the 30s when that was built. So it's a really cool sort of background of that. But it had become quite derelict in the 80s and 90s. Uh, The sunken gardens that were apparently really beautiful were gone, all of that. So this project was partly to, partly the climate change, but just to reinvigorate the park. Uh, One of the reports I read said that there, they brought three primary schools, two of which I have taught at, <laughs> supply taught at, from the local community to the park. And even though it was five minutes away from their doors, the kids had never been there or anything. It was really disused and probably, I guess, thought of as not very safe space. So some of the work they did was obviously the stuff around the floodplains, around the, the river or the stream. And then they added a ton of new trees. So there was a lot more shade which obviously is important for people's usability and things if the the temperatures are increasing. There were a lot of added walkways, so it was easier for people to navigate the park. Um, And they also, also that's more animal habitat. So they did a lot of impressive improvements to the park. And it is a really beautiful space. I do recommend visiting. They also built, as part of the uh, 2012 Olympics, they built a Olympic training center there. I couldn't find, I, I didn't look hard enough really, but I don't know what sport it was, but there is this big green center on the side of the park there. Now, there was a second level of the campaign to improve the lakes and stuff. As far as I could tell, all the th- reports I found said that they were still looking for the money and that was 2014. So I don't know. I never found anything that said the money had materialized, but it is a beautiful space. I really highly recommend it. But actually they, because this was the, this project, this climate change park, they did a lot of research on whether or not it was effective. And you, you can read it, Paul, their effectiveness of these different. So in terms of, let's say the number of bats who exist there, there was an improvement. For birds, butterflies, and dragonflies, there was an improvement in the number of them for habitat mapping. I don't know what that means. No, that was an improvement (laughs) as well. Public use also improved. Um, Landscape enhancement improved. And the River Corridor Survey is awaiting results. Well, it was when we read this. I don't know if it's come out now. And I think, actually, there was just a lot of information about how they did so much research and made this such a community project that they'd ask local the local schools and they got artists involved and it seemed like it was really community based again i don't live there i wasn't part of this i didn't even live in london well it started in 2008 finished in 2012 so i lived in london part of that time but yeah it seems like a really great project and as a park just to walk through as someone not from the neighborhood i think it's a really lovely space Now, the only other thing that was worth a mention, because it's mentioned in a lot of things and I think is really interesting, is the change in the community around there. So one of the things is, I read a lot of things that said, you know, there's a huge Indian community. I know that from teaching the schools, a huge Indian and Pakistani community around there. And the Punjabi and uh, Urdu are very commonly spoken languages. And I really wanted to dig into some kind of history of that. And I was doing a lot of research. And what I actually found was that the demographic shifts in Barking and Dagenham have been massive. So between the 2001 and the 2011 census, it went from 80% white British to 49% white British, suggesting it's hard to assess where people have gone, but maybe people moved out to the seaside and things. So when I was trying to dig into sort of the Asian and immigration history of the area, there isn't a lot because I think that history is very new. But again, something I'd like to learn about. So if people have stories or information, we'd love to hear it because we can have it on maybe Barking or, or Beacon Tree, Beacon Tree or one of the other podcasts for the area.
Fantastic. And talking of leaving the area, it's now time for us to look at the onward connections by means of transport other than the tube. Well, as Paul pointed out at the beginning, there is only one bus that actually goes past the station, which is the 62, which, I mean, I've ridden all the buses, but it's not, I mean, I've seen it a lot of times. I don't really know that much about it. It goes from the Gascoigne Estate in Barking, near Barking Station, really, to Mark's Gate. Now, Mark's Gate, I did just look up uh, because I didn't know what Mark's Gate actually was. So Mark's Gate is at the very top, uh, very northern top of uh, Barking and Dagenham. And it was a gate to Hainault Forest. So traditionally there was this gate to Hainault Forest. And it was Mark's Manor. So it was Mark, it, this gate, I don't know if it was part of the manor or it was near the manor. Now, the reason I want to recommend this bus is not just because I have to, because it's the only <laughs> bus to take. So it goes by Whalebone Lane. And Whalebone Lane has a mini golf course, which is the most random thing. Now, I haven't been to this mini golf course. I asked a friend. I've been wanting to go for ages. I asked a friend. He said it was great. It's the funniest thing to see. I think it's called Moby's or something. Like, it's a whale theme because it's Whalebone Lane. And so it's like Moby Dick or something. And you go on the road. It's on at the side of a pretty big road. And you can see it from... I'm not sure if you can see it from this bus, but you can definitely see it from a lot of buses. I don't know if it passes, but I know it passes nearby. And it's just this sort of thing on the side. And the water that ha- they've dyed it blue or it has blue underneath because this whale is coming out of this like glowing blue water which is quite alarming but i really want to go there and play mini golf so it's on the to-do list okay once, once we can do that we go visit the manor house then we go play mini golf fantastic let's do it sometime and walk through maysbrook park because it's very nice so yes that's obviously a lot of stuff that's not transport related but we want to try to get as much as we can absolutely <laughs> And having discussed where you can go next, it is time for us to discover where we're going next. And if you were waiting for the transport bits to resume, now is the time to start listening again. You know, I would really, I mean, I like the district line. I would like to go somewhere not on the district line, just because I get so tired of this drama between the railway (laughs) companies that all have 12 different names. It's a... I know some people are really into it, but it's not my thing. Okay, we're shaking it up here. Give the bag a good rustle. Grab one out. What is the next station going to be? Not the district line. Not the district line. Ooh, a station I quite like, Bakerloo Line, is Kensal Green. That's a nice one. Yeah, that's fun. That's an area we haven't touched Northwest London at all. Fantastic. Um, Kensal Green... (sighs) It's a station I haven't been to that many times. I used to use Kensal Rise on the overground a lot because I lived not far away and I used to volunteer at the Lexi Cinema, which is around there. But occasionally I would take go to Kensal Green if I needed to go somewhere else. Have you been to Kensal Green? I don't think I have. So Kensal Green, the thing that I remember most about Kensal Green, it's, it's, it's a sort of standard station. I mean, I'd say similar in the vein to to like Upney in terms of its design. It's just a brick building, I'm pretty sure. But the most memorable thing about Kensal Green, which has nothing to do with this podcast, is that there is some kind of business just across the way that has all these flags in the window and it has the worst maple leaf on the Canadian flag ever. It is so, the proportions are entirely wrong. And as a child, being have to draw maple leaves on flags all the time, I was so bitter about how hard it was to do. And I'm just so glad these people struggled as well. But that has very little to do with the station. So I think we'll come back to that. Yes. So next episode, Kensal Green and the terrible Canadian flag. (laughs) All right. All right. So that brings us to the end of Upney. As always, this podcast is produced and edited and researched and everything else by me, Emily Turner. And me, Paul Burkett Gray. The only thing we don't do is the artwork, and that is by Colleen McIsaac. You can find them at Little Foible Art on Instagram. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Roundel Round Pod. We'd love it if you're not following us on either or both of those already for you to follow us because we post lots of fun things. And we also had a response to our challenge last week on Instagram. 
Our challenge last week was to get from Tottridge and Whetstone to Upney without passing through any stations that begin with you, which was a tricky challenge because the two most sort of conventional routes go through Upper Holloway and Upton Park. And we did have a response sent to us on Instagram by Matthew White, whose handle is Every Roundel. And it was a brilliant response. So thank you, Matthew. We've got another challenge for you to try this week. And this week's challenge is to find a route going from Upney to Kensal Green Station. And our theme this week is staying green because Upney is on the district line, the green line of the London Underground. And of course, Kensal Green, well, the explanation is in the name. Now, of course, just like always, this challenge is just something where you find a route on the tube map. You don't actually need to ride it yourself. Just let us know which stations you travel through or draw a line on the tube map and send it to us. That's a great way to uh, tell us what your route would be. And what you need to do is find a route from Upney to Kensal Green that visits as many district line stations as possible without visiting any of them twice. Now, obviously, to get to Kensal Green, you'll need to go on the Overground or the Bakerloo line. You can use as many other Underground lines or the Overground or even the cable car as much as you like. Any of those TFL services are fine that are shown on the tube map. And you just need to go through as many district line stations as you can, but don't go through any of them twice. Let us know how you manage that, and we shall be looking forward to seeing all of your responses. I look forward to the one that uses the cable car 12 different times. That's what, that's what I really want to see. All right, Paul, we have our list of references for this week's episode. Yes, indeed. We always use lots of references in researching our episodes each week. Uh, for Upney, we used the books Steam to Silver, A History of London Transport Surface Rolling Stock by J. Graham Bruce. Uh, London's Underground Stations, A Social and Architectural Study by Lawrence Muneer. London Underground Stations by David LeBoff. Labyrinth, A Journey Through London's Underground by Tamsin Dillon, Will Self, Mark Wallinger, Marina Warner, Christian Woolmar, and Louise Koish. We used Why Do Shepherds Need a Bush? London's Underground History of Tube Station Names by David Hilliam, and What's in a Name? Origins of Station Names on the London Underground by Cyril M. Harris. We also used the newspaper article Post Memories, The Mystery of Matchstick Island by Zoa Hedges Stocks from the Barking and Dagenham Post. We used Case Study Maysbrook Climate Change Park Restoration Project from the website Restoring Europe's Rivers. We used an article on Barking Hospital from the website Lost Hospitals of London. And we used the website for Eastbury Manor House. All of the web addresses for those can be found in the full show notes, along with the full publication details of each of the books that I've just mentioned. Wonderful. So I guess that means you can join us again next week for Kensal Green.